Thanks so much, Patrick. And thanks to you all for, for being here to think through some of these questions and ideas with us. Uh, it's, a, it's a real honor. So today, the two of us are gonna attack an evaluative question about mass incarceration. Unlike yesterday's talk, which attempted to understand what explains why mass incarceration emerged in America, today's talk is going to directly ask what's wrong with mass incarceration, which is the title of our book manuscript. Now, to many of you, this might seem like a strange question. I'm sure you have the intuition that there's something obviously unjust about mass incarceration. And in fact, it's because we have that same intuition that the three of us, uh, John, Adana, and I, were all drawn towards writing about it. But this book started when I noted that a lot of the things we say about why mass incarceration is wrong, that it's expensive, that it doesn't reduce crime, that it's driven by the racist decisions of judges, juries, prosecutors, or police, that it's a system for punishing harmless behavior. A lot of these ideas depend on a standard story about where mass incarceration came from that many, including John and Adoner in their empirical work, think is flawed. Now, if that standard story is flawed and our standard moral indictments of mass incarceration depend on that standard story, we need a new moral framework for thinking about what, if anything, is actually wrong with mass incarceration. So that's what Adana and I try to do in our book. Now, in, in what follows, we're gonna walk and sometimes run through most of the argument of the book in number premise style. Um, so there's a handout in the chat, a uh, link to a handout pasted in the chat that'll help you follow along as we go. Um, and I hope that uh, this strategy uh, helps, helps you see the kind of bigger structure of the book. Um, I wanna note that giving you an overview of the argument of the whole book, which is really dense with, with argument, might at times make for a kind of overwhelming presentation. We cover so much empirical and normative ground. Um, so because we wanna leave time for discussion in places we're simply gonna to have to assert some of these arguments rather than defending them, but please feel free to push uh, back on us on anything you find unclear or unsound, and we'll try to elaborate as best as we can. And we're sure that you'll find plenty to disagree with and what's to come, but we hope that the effort of explaining to us why you disagree will both help clarify uh, what you and help us clarify our, our ideas too. Um, okay, so I'll hand it over to Adana. Before uh, we say anything substantive, I think we, we'd also both like to say something about why the two of us began working together. One of us is a philosopher, as you've heard, that's Chris, and I am a sociologist. We've both found ourselves frustrated by the way that our disciplines handle the relationship between factual questions and evaluative questions, between empirical research and normative argument. On the one hand, sociologists like myself have to address themselves to normative questions that ultimately I think is what gives our work meaning. It's why we write about the number of people in prison rather than the number of leaves on trees. But too often we think sociologists fall back on ideology when making these normative claims rather than making explicit normative arguments. Worse, sometimes I think sociologists seem to think that normative conclusions are just entailed by empirical arguments themselves. And we know this isn't the case. So consider that John, who's here, um, who's the source of so many of our empirical, so many of my empirical insights about mass incarceration, disagrees with me about the normative implications of those insights. And he disagrees about the argument that we are going to make to you today. So factual questions can't yield normative conclusions themselves. On the other hand, philosophers like Chris, although not Chris, often shy away from certain kinds of arguments or even certain kinds of questions because they don't have the empirical capacities to formulate or answer those questions. Because philosophers often outsource their empirical work to other disciplines, they rarely have all the inputs they need to answer a question comprehensively. And so we think there's a natural way that each discipline can help the other. And, we found a natural way that each of us can help the other. 
And in this kind of collaboration, we should say that we take a lot of inspiration from the faculty at Wisconsin, the Haven Center, Eric, obviously Eric Olin Wright centrally, Joel Rogers, Harry Brigas, these are all people who've been very influential um, in our own development, people who sought to combine empirical social science and social theory with analytic, moral, and political philosophy. Eric in particular is a key part of our overlapping intellectual heritage. Both Chris and I were advised at our dissertation stage by people who are profoundly influenced by Eric and the analytical Marxist tradition of which he was such an important part. And so this is just one of the many reasons that we're so keen to present our work at the Haven Wright Center. Okay, so the outline of the talk is on the slide in front of you. In the first part, we'll review some conventional answers to our title question and explain why we think they're unsound. In the second part, we'll argue very briefly that mass incarceration is a symptom of distributive injustice, but explain that this isn't really a satisfying answer to the title question either. In the third part, we'll argue that given the very low probability that the federal government will do anything about this distributive injustice anytime soon, state governments in the US have to make a decision about how to weigh the harms of policing, the harms of incarceration, and the harms of crime against each other. We call this the trade-off. Mass incarceration can be thought of as one way of making this trade-off. In the fourth part, we'll argue that mass incarceration is the wrong way of making this trade-off. State governments, will argue, should shift toward what we call the first world balance. They should do what other comparable countries do and shift resources from prisons to police. In total, we think that state governments should reduce the, incarceration, the incarcerated population by around 85% by dramatically cutting sentence lengths and then use those resources to hire around half a million more police officers, increasing police force sizes by roughly 50%. This conclusion is our answer to the question, what's wrong with mass incarceration? The problem with mass incarceration from the perspective of state governments in the US is that it represents an inefficient and unfair balance of the arms of the criminal legal system, prisons and policing. We're sure this is a surprising conclusion to many of you. It was a surprising conclusion for us to reach in our research as well, but this is where the logic has led us. Now, before we explain why we reached this conclusion, we wanna note that since much of what we'll argue strikes quite a pessimistic tone, we're actually happy or even eager to be proved wrong. So please don't pull punches in the, in the Q&A. Okay, so I'm gonna begin with the first part of the first part for you, which is with the conventional answers that you might give to the title question, what's wrong with mass incarceration? I'm gonna start with the first, which is mass incarceration is expensive. You often hear the United States spends an enormous amount of money uh, locking up offenders and policing American streets. And this could furnish, maybe you might think, a part of an answer to the question, what's wrong with mass incarceration? Perhaps mass incarceration is wrong because it is a colossal waste of resources. The trouble with this argument is that mass incarceration is actually very cheap. As this graph shows, even today's United States, despite being the advanced capitalist world's stingiest welfare state and the world's most overdeveloped penal state spends much more money on social policy than on penal policy. It spends about 10 times more. Depends a little bit on how you count, could be a little lower, could be a little higher, but about an order of magnitude more money is spent on the social policies on the right than on the penal policies on the left. Now, as John explained or argued yesterday, there is a simple reason for this. And we're gonna say more about this later in the talk. Mass incarceration, police, these are hyper-targeted policies while social policy is indiscriminate. This means that even while say per capita expenditure might be comparable, um, maybe even you might think, you know, it costs more to put a person in prison than to educate a child specifically, overall expenditure on social policy is just far, far greater. Oh, that's what this graph is supposed to show. Okay, so another common idea is that mass incarceration is wrong because it's counterproductive. 
because it doesn't reduce crime. Maybe it even makes crime worse. And there's some good evidence for this. Long prison sentences don't effectively deter crime. There's a lot of serious crime that happens inside prisons. And the experience of incarceration can make people more likely to reoffend in the future. We think all of these premises are true, but it doesn't follow that mass incarceration is actually counterproductive. So as this quote from a recent review of the empirical literature suggests, even though there's decent evidence that today the marginal effect of expanding the prison population is nil on crime, returns to punishment are a decreasing fun function of the level of punishment. So at today's rate, around 700 per 100,000, it's probably true that further incarceration is likely to have zero effect and maybe even some positive effect on the crime rate. But that's very unlikely to be true at lower levels of incarceration. And we have to remember that the incarceration rate in the US is around six or seven times rates in the rest of the developed world. So even at a significantly lower level of incarceration, the US would still stand out from the rest of the developed world. We'd still have mass incarceration, but it's unlikely that incarceration would have zero effect on crime. Now, a third kind of answer to the question is that mass incarceration is wrong because of the racism inside the criminal justice system. Now, black men are incarcerated at around six times the rate of white men. And in part, this racial disparity in incarceration results from the racist or racially biased decisions of police officers, of prosecutors, of juries, of judges. But our best evidence suggests that about 70 to 75% of the racial disparity in incarceration rates can be explained by disparities in crime rates. And indeed, as the graph on your screen shows, Black Americans are incarcerated at more or less ordinary rates given the level of serious crime in Black communities, rates that are roughly comparable to those found in many European and developed countries, and kind of surprisingly, rates that are lower than the analogous rate for white Americans. And what this implies is that even if we could end racism inside the criminal justice system, and we're quite pessimistic about the possibility of eliminating racism inside of today's American criminal justice system. But even if we could do that, even if police, prosecutors, juries, and judges treated Black Americans the way they treat white Americans, we wouldn't put an end to mass incarceration. Now, liberals and those on the left, I think, tend to be a little wary of this argument because they think that acknowledging racial disparities in crime rates might imply a racist belief about Black people or be used to justify racial disparities in punishment. And that's certainly a rhetorical tactic of people on the conservative right. But here it's really important to be clear eyed. Racial disparities in offending are neither an indication of any inherent racial differences, nor do they provide any good reason to think that mass incarceration is justified. Black people in America are more likely to break the law than other Americans on average, because they're more likely to live at the bottom of the American class structure with few opportunities to escape. They're more likely to have good reasons to commit crime. So as the number premise argument on the slide in front of you suggests, we should actually expect, given racial oppression, we should actually expect to see racial disparities in criminal offending. Crime is an index of oppression and racial disparities in crime are simply an index of racial oppression. One of the most common indictments of mass incarceration is the idea that both the scope and the distribution of imprisonment in this country are explained by the war on drugs. Michelle Alexander, for example, argues that these rising drug convictions accounted for the majority of the increased rate of imprisonment in the US between the early 70s and the early 2000s. But as this graph shows, only around 20% of the people in US prisons and jails are there for a drug conviction. And further, the majority of people who are incarcerated for a drug offense are not serving time for simple possession. They played some role in distribution. Many of those who are, who are officially serving time for simple possession 
were in fact guilty of distribution, but bargained for a guilty plea to a lower charge in exchange for waiving their right to a trial. So even if we removed everyone who's serving time for a drug offense from American prisons, we would still have mass incarceration. And as we discuss in depth in the book, it's not at all clear that the distribution of potentially harmful and addictive drugs like heroin should be completely decriminalized or that nobody should ever go to prison for any kind of drug crime. Finally, in, another common idea about what's wrong with mass incarceration has to do with the fact that many people think mass incarceration was the handiwork of elites. This is taken to be part of what makes mass incarceration so pernicious. According to Michelle Alexander, again, who's really the person who has done the most to raise awareness about mass incarceration and who's written kind of the standard account of where it came from, these elites who gave us mass incarceration were Republican operatives and presidents who in the 1960s conceived of a law and order agenda as a way to win white working class voters to the Republican Party. The problem with this view is that even where the black public has had control of the levers of criminal justice, the outcomes do not seem to have been very different. This was the subject of recent books by uh, Michael Javen Fortner and James Foreman Jr. about Harlem and DC. Increasing local control over the criminal justice system often seems to lead to more and even sometimes more unequal punishment, not less. One other reason it's strange to make this argument is that the American criminal legal system is actually probably the most democratic of comparable systems. Decisions inside America in the criminal legal system are subject to far more democratic input <clears throat> than systems in the rest of the developed world. Police officers are supervised by elected officials, elected legislatures make many of the laws, elected prosecutors carry them out, and elected judges adjudicate. That's not true in European systems. No other system in the advanced world accords the public such sway. And so to sum up, we've given you five kind of conventional answers and we review a couple of others in the book. Many of the conventional answers to our title question, we think are empirically or normatively unsound. Okay, so then what, if anything, is actually wrong with mass incarceration? In the book, we argue that mass incarceration is explained by the exceptionally high level of serious crime in the US. Now, America has an incarceration rate almost an order of magnitude higher than other developed countries, but it also has a, a crime rate or a rate of violence and serious crime that's almost an order of magnitude uh, higher than other developed countries. So as the graph we showed earlier already suggests, if you decompose the incarceration rate into the rate of serious crime, which we measure via the homicide rate, and the number of people incarcerated per serious crime, you see that the incarceration rate in the US has more to do with the rate of serious crime, which stands apart from other developed countries, than it does with the rate at which we convert serious crime into incarceration, which is broadly in line with the rest of the developed world. And we're happy to talk more about the homicide rate and measurement questions in, in the Q&A. Now, one other thing it's worth noting here is that sometimes when people argue that mass incarceration in fact has nothing to do with the level of crime, they'll show you a graph like this one, which shows the trajectories of the property crime rate, the violent crime rate and the incarceration rate all normalized to a common scale over the last 30 years of American history. This is a graph that I've seen many times, I've even showed it sometimes. You'll see that these two things look like ships moving in the night. Looks like the crime rate and the incarceration rate are totally unconnected. But there are two problems with this, with drawing the inference that they're unconnected based on this evidence. There are two, two problems with this graph. One is that it, it starts strategically in the 1990s. So if you start the graph instead in the 1960s, you see that in fact, there was a significant rise in crime that predated the significant rise in incarceration. The other issue with the graph is that this is a comparison of apples to oranges, or it's a comparison of the stock of people in prison, which includes both past and present incarcerations, with the number of amount of crime happening in any given year. You really actually ought to be comparing flow 
to flow. So we compare the crime rate to the change in the incarceration rate. And when you do that, you see, in fact, that the change in the incarceration rate is much more closely calibrated to the crime rate. OK, so for now, we're going to assert that the reason for the high levels of serious crime in the US is that the US has much more concentrated poverty cluster disadvantage than any other developed country. Our view is that this is the key reason for the high levels of serious crime in the US. And we're not going to defend this right now, even though it does need defending against the view that other things explain American exceptionalism uh, about uh, in with respect to crime, for example, guns. Um, we're happy to say more about this in, in the discussion, uh, but for now, we're just going to assert this point. Um, and then in the book, we argue that the, and, and in some other work, we argue that the kind of concentrated disadvantage one sees in the US is unjustifiable. And it's unjustifiable, we think, not just on left-wing or egalitarian grounds, which obviously indict it, but also unjustifiable from the perspective of any of the major right-wing theories of justice or efficiency as well. Um, so that's something that we take up more in, in another series of papers. Um, but for now, I, I think we can conclude uh, that mass incarceration is a symptom of social injustice. Uh, it's a symptom of the unjust basic structure of the United States. But, and this is important, we think to have shown that mass incarceration is a symptom of injustice is not the same thing as showing that it is itself unjustified. So when we wrote the first draft of this book, we didn't quite appreciate that. We argued, in fact, that the fact that mass incarceration is a symptom of unjust inequality is why mass incarceration was wrong, is wrong. Um, but it was our students in, in our seminar that we co-taught last year who pointed out that this was unsatisfying. After all, they said, if mass incarceration is a symptom of injustice, perhaps it's also the right way to respond to that injustice, so long as that injustice holds. From the perspective of the state and local officials who craft criminal justice policy and who can't do very much at all about distributive injustice nationwide, perhaps mass incarceration is the best they could do. And if that's true, then what we've shown seems to amount to the conclusion that mass incarceration is in fact justified. So to explain why that's not the right way to look at things, why state and local governments can actually do much better, we're gonna to turn to the next two parts of the argument. So as, as Chris has just said or implied, the federal government in the United States has the capacity to effect the kind of redistributive taxation and spending that would end distributive injustice in America. And thus, we think, would reduce serious crime to the levels you see in other advanced capitalist countries. But we think, we also think that this kind of redistribution is unfortunately very unlikely in today's United States. We broadly have what sociologists in the crowd might recognize as a kind of power resources view of redistribution. The poor are able to get redistribution from the state when they're able to put pressure on rich people to concede it, which they do by disrupting the routines on which the rich depend for their wealth. But today, the American working class is electorally and otherwise divided. The labor movement is at its lowest ebb in almost a century. And therefore, for now, to us, American social democracy, redistribution of the kind that both Chris and I would support, seems to us a distant dream. And so we think that, as Chris was saying, a meaningful question before us today is given the improbability of redistribution led by the federal government, what should state governments, to whom penal policy in the United States falls, what should state governments do about prisons, police, and crime? What should be done about penal policy? Is mass incarceration the right way to respond to this distributive injustice? We don't think so, and we're about to explain why. Okay, so just a quick note, the, the federal kind of state way of putting this isn't the only way this question could be understood. So another way is, Another way to understand this question is, if expansive social policy isn't likely, how should penal policy be organized? 
Uh, another way might be if the ideal solution to crime, i.e. social democracy is impossible, what's the right non-ideal response? We're not yet completely sure whether the federal state division is the right way of thinking about this question, but that's what we're going, that's the way that we're going to frame things for the purpose of this presentation. Now, in recent years, scholars on the left have paid a lot of attention to the many ways in which harsh policing and concentrated imprisonment impose deep psychological, symbolic, political, and economic burdens on disadvantaged communities, rather than merely imposing physical injuries on individuals. Concentrated incarceration, for example, can weaken informal social controls, so, so distrust, undermine civic organization, and depress political participation in disadvantaged neighborhoods. Similarly, abusive and omnipresent policing can entrench racial residential segregation and so legal cynicism. And arrest records can sometimes be a debilitating disadvantage in the labor and rental housing markets, despite the fact that many of those who are arrested ultimately have their charges dismissed. And all of these burdens are disproportionately borne by the disadvantaged. But scholars and activists and advocates advocates on the liberal left often ignore the fact that serious crime has these very same kinds of consequences. Living in a violent neighborhood reduces people's incentives to do things that are important for upward mobility, for social cohesion, for civic organization, and for physical health. Neighborhood violence can be traumatizing and stressful, causing lack of sleep, impeding children's cognitive development and their attention and impulse control. Businesses are wary of investing in neighborhoods where crime is rife, leaving them without access to base, basic retail services, including groceries and healthy food options. Property values drop, reducing funding for local public schools and other municipal services. And upwardly mobile residents of high crime neighborhoods move out, which exacerbates the concentration and clustering of disadvantage in those areas. Just as criminal conviction or an arrest record can be a stigma on the job market, victims of crime can also be stigmatized in extremely disadvantaged communities where mutual respect can become a zero sum game. So as the graph in front of you shows, the disadvantaged, whether measured by race, class, or some combination, are very overrepresented amongst those victimized by police, prisons, and crime. Okay, but one might nonetheless think, despite the fact that all of these harms exist, that the harms associated with policing and incarceration are morally different in kind from the harms associated with crime because of their source. After all, it is the state and its officials who are responsible for police abuse and incarceration, while it's private citizens who commit the vast majority of interpersonal crime. So perhaps this is just a qualitatively different kind of harm. We don't think so. We think that taking this view commits you to a very strong moral distinction between doing and allowing harm. On this view, the state is obligated to make sure that its agents don't directly do anything harmful, even if that means allowing private citizens to harm one another. Now that distinction might seem intuitively appealing, but it really has some very extreme implications. The only way to completely eliminate the risk of government officials doing harm is to eliminate the course of power of government. And this would commit us to some kind of political anarchism, which we think is a strange position for those on the liberal left. For it's not clear how, as the premises on the slide in front of you suggests it's not clear how you could be committed to the view that the state is not permitted to do anything coercive, yet believe that the state must coerce the rich, or the state would be able or permitted to coerce the rich. The well-off are not likely to give up their wealth voluntarily, and the only way for the state to ensure something like a welfare state is to use coercion. And so we think that this kind of distinction between doing and allowing doesn't really work. In other, and what it implies for these three harms is that harm di caused directly by the state, prisons and police, doesn't have some kind of trumping power over harm caused indirectly by the state or harm allowed by the state. 
We think, in other words, as a consequence, that governments are obligated to weigh these harms against each other. Now, it's possible to accept what we've said so far and to say that state governments should just reduce all three kinds of harms, policing, incarceration, and crime. Um, the typical way of making this case is to argue that state and local governments ought to take the money they have and redistribute it from police and prisons to social policy, social programs. This would reduce crime and it would reduce the harms of policing and incarceration, supposedly. Something like this was the message of many activists after the 2020 protests when demands to defund the police took off. The trouble in our view is that this proposal is either empirically implausible or politically infeasible, which depends on the kind of social policy one ha has in mind. So if state governments were to take money spent on prisons and police, and redirect it to the traditional universal forms of social policy that make up uh, most of social spending in the US, crime would almost surely increase. That's because most of the beneficiaries of these kinds of social policies are not people who are ever likely to commit crime. And so spending on those policies to reduce crime is just exceedingly inefficient. With the limited funds the cheap carceral state makes available, you, you just wouldn't be able to reduce crime by spending on universal social policy like Medicare, Medicaid. Um, by our calculations, if you wager that the underdevelopment of America's welfare state is responsible for American levels of homicide as we do, the implication is that universal social spending is about 13 times less efficient at reducing crime per dollar spent on it today than a dollar spent on policing today. But that's not usually what advocates have in mind. They don't imagine defunding the police and using this to fund pensions or Medicare. They imagine spending the money on hyper-targeted social policies like jobs programs or vocational training for the incarcerated or for the especially disadvantaged. But here's where we think that this kind of idea runs into a different problem, what we call the efficiency feasibility paradox, which is illustrated on the graph in front of you. As this graph suggests, there are some hyper-targeted social programs that have in fact been shown to be efficient at reducing crime, particularly high quality early childhood interventions and preschool programs, which cost typically tens of thousands of dollars per child spent over several years. The, the trouble is that it's impossible to imagine that these kinds of programs could ever be politically feasible. Hyper-targeted social spending on just the truly disadvantaged is a political impossibility in a democratic capitalist society. It's impossible, that is, to imagine a public voting for policies which benefit only the very disadvantaged, since the disadvantaged are always a minority of the electorate. It's no surprise to us that you don't see any democratic capitalist country do this at scale. Countries that have these kinds of policies that have say high quality early childhood interventions or preschool programs, they give those kinds of programs to everyone. Now, there are ways to make uh, these kinds of hyper-targeted programs politically feasible, namely by scaling down the benefit, by making the programs less high quality so that they wouldn't be the envy of the middle class. And that's kind of what the Head Start program looks like. But the problem then is that the less generous you make these programs, the less impact they have on crime. So this is what we call the efficiency feasibility paradox. So we conclude from this that state governments face a kind of inescapable tragic trade-off between these harms of crime, punishment, and policing and they have to weigh these harms uh, against each other. Now, if we're right about that, if we're right about what we've argued so far, this is really a choice, this choice that Chris just outlined is really a choice about what should be done about penal policy. What should be done about the level of imprisonment and the level of policing in the United States today? We think it's helpful to visualize this. So, this graph shows a two by two space, which is the number of prisoners per 100,000 people on the y axis and the number of police per 100,000 
on the x-axis. The question we think really boils down to where in the two by two space defined by the level of incarceration and the level of policing should the US lie? Now, it's important to note that as this graph shows, today the US lies in a very different kind of place in this two by two space than the rest of the developed world. The United States incarcerates around three people per police officer it employs. The rest of the developed world employs around 3.5 police officers per prisoner. And we call this ratio, which is given by the lower dashed red line, the first world balance. The slopes of those lines give the prison to police ratio, the penal balance ratio that, that John and I were discussing yesterday. Okay, so now on its own, the fact that the US does things very differently than the rest of the developed world isn't an argument that the US ought to do things the way that other countries do. This is just a descriptive fact about the US. But in, in our book, we defend the idea that the US should do things the way the rest of the developed world does. Um, we defend the idea that the US should do penal policy by leaning much less on incarceration and much more on policing. Um, now, if the US were to implement the first world balance, it would require us to reduce the incarcerated population by around 2 million people, radically cutting sentence lengths, then use the savings to hire something around half a million more police officers. And we think that this would be justified. So why? Why should you believe that? Well, the first reason is that we think it would maximize aggregate well-being. So we think from a kind of broadly consequentialist perspective, this is the best option that state governments have. And then, after, so after we argue that, we'll also give you some reasons to believe that this would also be in the interests of the least well-off, the most disadvantaged people in America. One of the things that's wrong with mass incarceration, on our view, is that our current way of doing penal policy, leaning so heavily on pris prisons uh, with respect to policing or relative to policing, unjustly burdens the most disadvantaged Americans. You might ask which of these arguments is more important, which takes precedence, but our strategy in this book in general and in, in what we've been working on is to be ecumenical about first principles, to be ecumenical about whether we're really consequentialists or really something else. Um, and, the re and the reason we do that is because we actually think that the first world balance is justified on multiple first order principles about justice. And so these first order disagreements don't really end up mattering all that much. So let me explain why we think that moving to the first world balance would maximize aggregate well-being. We think that the primary first order welfare consequences of moving to any point in this two by two space are the following. What it implies for the number of people who have to spend time in prison in America's awful inhumane prisons. What it implies for the number of homicides and the amount of serious crime. And what it implies for the number of people brutalized by the police, the number of people arrested and killed by the police. To judge the welfare consequences of any move in this two by two space and to judge the welfare consequences of the move from say the status quo to the first world balance, we have to estimate the effect of incarceration on serious crime and homicide, the effect of policing on serious crime and homicide, the effect of policing on arrests and the effect of policing on police killing. In the book, we use the latest best practice estimates from the empirical literature to estimate these where they're available. In one case, in the case of police killings, the effect of increasing or decreasing police employment on police killings, there isn't actually any reliable empirical estimate available. And so we rely on our own theoretical and empirical work. But for that reason, I've kind of grayed out, we've grayed out police killings because we're not particularly confident as you about what would happen. As you'll see, though, the conclusion doesn't actually end up depending much on which estimate you use for police killings. So the results of these calculations are in front of you in the table on the screen. You can see where we take our specific estimates from 
in the text at the very bottom. As the table suggests, we estimate that the first world balance would be a world of far fewer people in prison. That's kind of trivially, definitionally true. Fewer lives lost to homicide and less serious crime. It would also be a world of many more arrests. There would be greater police presence. And what we know from the empirical literature is that more police presence leads to more arrests. We do think it would be a world of fewer police killings for reasons we can explain in the Q&A, but that's something that we won't say any more about in what follows right now. Now, the question really is, would this be justified on consequentialist grounds? We've shown you the change in terms of prisoners, lives, and arrests, but this is just empirical so far. We've taken the best estimates out there and plugged them into the transition suggested by comparative facts. To decide whether this would be justified, in other words, to answer the normative question about whether this would be justified, one has to denominate these different consequences shown here in the third column in, some, in a common currency that captures something like well-being. And there are really two questions here. How do we compare an arrest to a year in prison? How do we compare this to this? And how do we compare a year in prison to a life loss? These are really difficult questions. There's no obvious good answer. We choose to convert everything here to something like years of life. There are other possibilities, but we think they don't make much of a difference to our final conclusions. And so how do we do these conversions to years of life? Well, we suggest that, as you can see on the bottom, the average arrest is probably as bad as about a week in prison. Most arrests don't result in stays in jail, and those that do don't last more than a few days, typically, though not at all always. There are some really egregious cases, of which I'm sure some of you are aware. We then suggest that a year in prison is probably about as good or about as bad as a one quarter of a year spent outside. That is, being in prison is equivalent to losing about three quarters of a year of your life, being in prison for a year. We think this probably actually understates how bad prison is in the United States today. But modifying this was, as you'll see, will only bias the argument in our favor, in favor of the first world balance. So we stick with this estimate that you can see on the bottom. With these conversions, these kind of conversions from arrests to prison years and prison years to life years, and based on the observation that the average homicide amounts to about 30 years of life lost since the average person who's killed is around 30, 35, we can denominate all of this in the common currency called years of life. And that's shown before you on the screen. Now, as I think you can probably see if you try to add these together, the Yellow are years of life saved, and the red are years of life increased from moving to the first world balance. The results of this are pretty resounding. They strongly favor the first world balance over the status quo. The primary cost of moving to the first world balance is the enormous increase in arrests, almost an 80% an 80 increase in arrests over the 10 million that happen annually, roughly, in the United States today. But we determine based on these empirical and normative judgments that the cost of these increased arrests is outweighed and actually outweighed overwhelmingly by the benefits from the decline in incarceration and the reduction in homicide and other crime. You can see that just the decline in incarceration, the decline of 1.5 million prisoner years is about a hundred times more significant than the costs of the increased arrest. Now, one concern you might have is that you might say we bias the argument in our favor by considering only these two points, considering only the status quo and mass incarceration. After all, as you can just see from what I just said, so much of what's better about the first world balance from the perspective of a consequentialist is a function of the extensive decarceration, the extensive release of people from America's awful prisons. What, you might say, what if we had decarceration without the increase in policing? What if we had decarceration with a decrease in policing? And that's something I think like conventional wisdom about what ought to be done about penal policy today in the United States. As this graph shows in the book, we run the exercise that I just walked you through for the first world balance. We run this exercise for every point in the part of this two by two space that is revenue neutral or saves money that is feasible, in other words. 
arrows here on this graph run in the direction of points that increase aggregate well being relative to points in the region around them. And as the graph suggests, we find that in fact, the first world balance lies right around the most efficient point in this two by two space. You will see, I think you can tell that defund the kind of convent, what we're taking to be the conventional wisdom, which is a decline, dramatic decline in incarceration and decline in policing is probably more efficient than the status quo, but the first world balance is more efficient than defund, more promotes aggregate well-being more efficiently. And so we think it would be justified on consequentialist grounds. Okay, but many people argue that public policy should not aim simply to maximize aggregate well-being. It has to be sensitive to how the benefits and burdens of society in general and the cr criminal legal system in particular are distributed. So consider, for example, what Derek Parfit calls the priority view. Benefiting people matters more, the worse off those people are. Now, one corollary of the priority view or what's sometimes called prioritarianism is that burdening people matters less, the better off those people are. The burdens of how governments choose to strike the balance between policing and incarceration, no matter how they choose to do so, will be disproportionately borne by the disadvantaged. As we showed already, victims of crime, victims of police abuse and brutality, and people behind bars all tend to be drawn very disproportionately from the, rank, from the ranks of the least well off. They're disproportionately black and disproportionately poor. Those who are most likely to be victims of the worst kinds of crime, in particular homicide, are the same people who are most likely to be abused, brutalized, or killed by the police. And they're also those who are at highest risk of serving time in prison. But importantly, these groups are not identical. So as this graph in front of you now shows, Black people are more disproportionately overrepresented among murder victims and the incarcerated and those arrested for serious offenses than they are in the ranks of those who have been arrested for petty offenses or killed by the police in every given year. In fact, Black people seem to be underrepresented among those who report ever having been arrested in their lifetimes. High school dropouts are far more disproportionately overrepresented in the incarcerated population than they are among those who have been arrested in their lifetime. They make up 54% of the former group, but only 14% of the latter and 10% of the total adult population. So we think something like the priority view, prioritizing the interests of the disadvantaged or the least well off, lends further support to the case for the first world balance. The burdens of the status quo under which the US leans so heavily on long prison sentences relative to policing fall more disproportionately on black people and the poor and especially the black poor than do the benefits. Shifting to the first world balance would shift the burdens from a more disproportionately disadvantaged population to a somewhat better off population. So we conclude that Mass incarceration is the wrong way to respond to extreme inequality and high levels of crime. State governments should move from mass incarceration to the first world balance. Mass incarceration is wrong. In our book, we have some additional moral arguments for this shift, but we think we've thrown enough at you all for now. So thank you for thinking through these issues with us and we look forward to hearing your thoughts and reactions. All right, well, that was really super interesting and I'm sure uh, provocative for po folks. Um, and, I, and part of what I hope it has provoked are questions and comments. So even though many of you are familiar with how this works, I'm gonna go over it, that there are two options for raising questions or making comments. One of which is um, that you can go on camera and use your own voice at the very bottom. You'll see on the menu at the far right, reactions button, you can raise your hand alerting me you want to go on camera and ask a question and I will um, turn it over to you. Alternatively, you can go on the chat um, and just write in a question and I'll read it for you. So what we're going to do is take questions three at a time, two or three at a time, and um, the queue is currently open. So please do not hesitate 
to join in. If I don't hear from anybody soon, I can I can start things off. All right, let me try to do that. And in the meantime, please come up with some things, questions of your own. I, I, this isn't a fully baked question or a fully formulated question, but I'll throw it out there in any case. I mean, I just thinking about that graph that you put up with the, the contrast between the United States slope um, with respect to in, imprisonment and policing contrasted with the one with the rest of the developed world or much of the rest of the developed world. If I understood correctly, you want to target roughly midway between that other slope um, as the uh, where the United States should be. And since it's a normative question uh, as well, I'm just curious why the target isn't, you said something about this, but I, I wonder why the target isn't sort of at the very bottom of that slope, Finland, or since I have three of my kids are Norwegian citizens, I'm thinking of Norway as well. It wasn't on there, but I can imagine that it's even lower than Finland. But why isn't that the option? Because part of what it seems to imply is that Finland should move up the slope um, and the ones that are higher on the slope should move down. Um, the, the, in other words, Finland should have more policing and incarceration, and the countries that are further up the slope should have less of each. Um, and since it's a normative argument, it seems to me to be too um, very constrained by the pragmatism, uh, uh, too constrained by the pragmatism of what's currently possible in the United States rather than um, thinking instead of what would be ideal for the United States, leaving aside what's currently possible, and then figuring out how to make the more ideal, what should happen, happen, um, less constrained. All right, so I don't know if that was a coherent couple of questions, but there you have it. Uh, Janet and Lloyd have a question. So I'm gonna ask you, hold on one second, please. Um, to go on camera. Yes, I'm on camera and I'm unmuted. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I think the idea of having more police is not necessarily a negative one, but I think the great problem in our society is that uh, there is a culture among so many police that uh, they don't have the serve and protect mentality. Uh, I think this could be very valuable in establishing community relations if they were properly motivated and properly trained. All right, thank you. And then we have another question in the chat that says Chicago has increased its police budget by $200 million and has proposed cutting its educational budget by $40 million. Do the speakers see any problem with this? All right, so there are three questions. And in the meantime, I hope others will come up with some of their own. You wanna start, Chris? Sure, I can, I can start. So okay. I'll start with your first question, Patrick. Why, why do we propose that specific point on the slope that we're calling the first world balance uh, rather than going to say the bottom of, of the line where Finland is or where Norway might be. So yeah, why? so even if you buy the argument that there should be roughly three and a half cops per prisoner rather than three prisoners per cop, that doesn't really tell you anything about the total number of prisoners and cops that, that would make sense in any given society, including this one. So the, the line that we draw from mass incarceration where we are now to where we think the US should be on that first world balance slope is actually determined by what we think would be revenue neutral. So um, it costs around four times more to hire a cop uh, than it does to incarcerate someone per year. Um, and so we, we think we can get roughly one additional cop for every four fewer people we have in prison. Um, but why not, why not have far fewer cops and far fewer prisoners? The answer is really that we think it would be inefficient and unfair to do that given the kind of society that this is. This is a high crime 
society. We don't really have other feasible options for uh, reallocating those funds to programs that would effectively uh, contain crime. So spending on policing is, is really the, the most kind of effective feasible option that state governments have. And so we don't think that penal spending should be reduced. We think at best it can be kept uh, neutral, but just reallocated from prisons to policing. So that's why we land on that point. Uh, and I think this relates to your second question about why we constrain ourselves so much as to what is possible rather than just arguing or making an argument as to what would be ideal in this society since it is a normative argument. Um, well, you know, we did, we do say some things about what we think would be ideal in this society, namely, we think uh, a shift towards more of a kind of Scandinavian style of social democracy would be ideal. But if that was all one could do uh, in the realm of normative argument, then we really wouldn't have normative arguments that are useful for public policy discussions. And that's kind of what we want to add as well. We want to talk about public policy options that might actually be on the table, but also we want to talk about, in particular, criminal justice policy and not just social policy, social programs. Um, and so that's, you know, that's a big part of why we think it's important to um, add some feasibility constraints to what is under consideration and what and and uh, what the what the option set is, and then deliberating in, within kind of a constrained option set. Um, Don, do you want to take a, a stab at, at Janet's question about police training and culture? Yeah, sure. Um, before I do that, let me just say one more thing about this last point about why we constrain ourselves. I think one other thing to note is that. It isn't actually clear that even if we were to implement mass, uh, sorry, even if we were to implement something like social democracy in the United States, that we shouldn't also change the way we do penal policy. Because if you imagine simply doing nothing different in the realm of penal policy and having social democracy in the United States, penal policy might still be unjustified given how heavily we rely on severity rather than certainty. So in some sense, these are also two arms of government policy that can be thought out, thought about separately. And um, we think that's important as well. Um, on Janet's excellent question about police culture, I think, I think in effect, our argument is that we're just very, very pessimistic about what one can do in the realm of training to change the way in which police do their work. I mean, in many ways, this has been the emphasis of the way in which people have thought about policing for a long time. This was the subject of the Obama task force on policing was to encourage better training. And we just think that's very, very difficult to do. I'll give you one reason that's related to our argument about police killings to think that it would be very difficult to do. I'll just share another graph to do this. So um, can everyone see this graph here on the screen? So this graph shows the relationship between police killings on the y-axis and police per homicide, which is the state footprint, the number of police there are per homicide. Now you can see that the cross-national evidence suggests a negative relationship between the number of police per homicide and the number of police kill, uh, killings per million people. You can see that the developed world clusters down here has a lot of police, for the most part, the developed world has a lot of police per homicide and very little police killing. The developing world is up here and the United States is kind of an exception. The United States lives as in so many other indicators with the developing world rather than the developed. And so if you think about the number of people killed by the police as kind of an index of police culture, you might think in fact that police culture is endogenous or produced by the kind of problem that policing confronts in the United States, which is that the police are just overwhelmed by violence. I like to think of policing in the United States as sort of similar to the early modern state. If anyone has read Foucault's Discipline and Punish, in the early pages of that book, Foucault describes the early modern state as having no infrastructural power, 
and therefore relying on kind of the spectacular violence, the spectacular brutality that we are familiar with from early modern history. And so you can think of American policing as somewhere between the early modern state and the developed world of the bottom right-hand corner of this graph. So in that sense, police culture is actually a product, we think, rather than a cause of, well, of the where we are in this two by two space. And then there was one more question, which I'm forgetting. It, it concerns Chicago and- Oh, that's right, that's right. Chris, uh, I'll say something, then you can say something about that. I think um, to be very clear, what we haven't defended at all in this, book is the idea that you should take away from social spending and spend on penal policy. We think we, we, that's not the argument that we're making. The argument that we're making is about a redistribution of resources within penal policy. And the other thing I think is that there also is some reason to think that one would need to, one would need more specific information to pronounce on any specific case because different cities are in different places in this two by too, and I don't know specifically where Chicago is. One thing that, for instance, New York has done over the last 20 years is moved where it was in this two by two space. So specific questions like that, I think just require specific answers and more information than we have. That might be a little bit of a punt, but that's how I think about it. Chris? Yeah, no, I don't really have anything to add to that, but maybe we can bring the, the kind of main graph uh, back up uh, to the screen so people can have that in mind as, as we discuss these questions. So, you want, should I share screen or should I just stop sharing? No, no, I think you can bring that back up. So the the I just want to elaborate a little bit on the this point one, right? made, which is that, so th this graph shows some international variation in the way that governments balance uh, imprisonment and policing. And you find the same thing in uh, between states and between cities. So New York, for example, is a city uh, that strikes this balance between incarceration and policing uh, in a way that's more similar to uh, other developed countries. And then you have states and, and cities that strike the balance, um, it, you know, a, a much more uh, incarceration heavy balance. And generally uh, that, that goes along with uh, inequality. So the, the states and cities that are more unequal tend to strike a more incarceration heavy balance. Um, and those that are more equal, uh, also just more wealthy, tend to strike a more uh, police heavy balance. Okay. Um, we have some more questions, in fact, more than three. So I'm going to go with Lauren Peabody next, uh, if you can go ahead. All right. Hey, Donner. Hi, hi Chris. Um, you, well, you just started to, to get into my question a second ago, but I, I was curious if you could say more about um, your your views on changes to policing strategy we should make or, or what you've seen in terms of like varieties of policing strategies among these developed countries. I mean, some of these countries with higher uh, numbers of cops, like, you know, they're not necessarily carrying handguns, for example. Um, and, uh, you know, important question for many reasons, but it's especially, you know, if you want a viable left leftist political strategy, it's got to be, um, you know, garner support among, you know, the most oppressed groups in the country. And, uh, you know, police aren't exactly popular among uh, disadvantaged communities. Thanks, Lauren. So we have a couple, as I said, I have a couple of other questions um, in the chat and I'll read one out from Nandini who says, if ever and when unkind states are challenged in terms of the disproportionate imprisonment of the resource poor, marginalized and socially vulnerable people, how do state re authorities react? And then it adds, how, do, how does race play a role in this aspect? And then we've got a question from, I believe it's, it's a little obscured, but Greg, a county librarian in the US of my acquaintance put out a Black Lives Matter display. The county sheriff called and said that unless the display came down, his department would not answer any 9-11 calls from the library. The enlightened reaction may be that the sheriff was out of line. I would instead suggest that the sheriff, sheriff was doing his job, that his job is to impose a racialized system of social control, 
and his mistake was to say the quiet part loud. Why assume that the purpose of police in the U.S. is to stop or solve crime? So there's a couple, there are three more, two more questions, excuse me. Great, uh, Donna, do you wanna start with Lauren's question? I see you brought this graph up that's relevant and then and then maybe I can take uh, some of the next. Oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't realize I was still sharing my screen, but um, okay. So Lauren, this is the graph that came to mind, which I think I showed yesterday also. Um, and it also, uh, I think relates to Janet and Lloyd's question, which is that I think we're just very, this is this is the kind of thing that people have argued that should happen to policing in the United States. It's the kind of thing that I think you see kind of liberal academics argue a lot that we should just change the way police do policing. I mean, I don't know how many people argue that we should remove their handguns given how many civilians have handguns, but you might extend it to that idea as well. And I just think I'm very pessimistic or we're very pessimistic about the idea that you could really make much headway here. One way we could deal with this is we could just say, if you're right, you're right. Let's have all of those things that <clears throat> you think we could have through police training. But there are just some reasons to think that that wouldn't be very much. So one thing that people often say about the police is that we should have more what they call focus, focus deterrence. Police should focus on serious crime rather than petty crime. But as you can see from the bottom panel here, police in the United States are comparatively, at least relatively focused on homicide relative to other arrests, uh, other things that police do. Um, um, and really it seems like the issue here is the footprint of the police rather than the focus of the police. At least that's our approach. Um, the, other, the other thing you mentioned was that you thought that it's strategically important to take stock of public opinion about this when trying to think about what should be done. And I think that's totally right. It is, I, I, I would make a distinction here between what's strategically important and what's normatively relevant. I think public opinion is not normatively relevant insofar as the public can be mistaken about many kinds of things, but it is totally, I agree, strategically relevant. But I think actually the public opinion data that I have looked at supports rather than um, supports rather than suggests, so supports our kind of proposal rather than suggests our proposal is impossible. There is majority support in African-American communities and particularly in poor African-American communities for increasing police. There is also a lot of distrust of police alongside, but, and that would be a strategic obstacle for sure. But when simply asked about whether you want more police for a long time, African-American communities have said that they do. We don't think that has much weight in why we think this is justified, but I think, it, or any weight in why it's justified, but it does have strategic relevance, I agree. Um, Chris, why don't you go and then if, if you don't answer everything, I'll answer. Okay, so I, I wanna talk a little bit about the, the question, uh, and I'm sorry, I, I missed uh, your name who asked the question about the, the sheriff and the, the BLM display. Um, so I took the question to be, why, why should we assume that the purpose or the function of American policing is crime control rather than impose, you know, imposing a, a racialized system of social control or something like that? This is an idea that, that we hear quite often. Um, well, so there's one sense in which we're not assuming that. We're not assuming, for example, that police officers everywhere are well motivated or that there's no racism in the criminal legal system. Um, in fact, we're, you know, we're, we're quite pessimistic about that and we're, we're pessimistic, we're quite pessimistic about changing that in a way. But that might not exactly be what you mean by the purpose or function of policing. So you could think about the purpose or the function in terms of the individual motivations of uh, of police officers and other actors in the criminal legal system. You could think about it in terms of kind of legislative intent, legislative history. And uh, in that light, I think it's quite clear that uh, policing in America, when you go back to the beginning, did ha always have the function and purpose of imposing a racialized system of social control. But we're here more focused on what the effect of policing is and in particular, what is the effect of increasing police force sizes or decreasing police force sizes? And, and the empirical literature is pretty clear that there's a, there's a, a huge 
kind of prime control effect of increasing police force sizes. This is in a way the most efficient thing that you can do to control, control crime. Uh, whether or not that means you know that whether or not cops are well motivated for the most part or not police uh, do deter crime quite well and i think that goes to the point of this racialized system of social control so we live in this racially unequal uh and and just unequal in general kind of a society and crime plays an important role in that so Crime, you know, as we as we argued, crime is a really big problem in the most disadvantaged communities, which tend to be very disproportionately black. And so it's not clear at all to us that reducing the number of police would reduce the extent to which we live in a kind of racially unjust system of social control. In fact, we think probably that would exacerbate things. So we're not, our, we're not defending the motivations or kind of the legislative history of policing. We're just defending it sort of on the grounds of what effects it has. Uh, increasing the number of police seem to reduce uh, racial disparity and racial oppression in this country, even though there are some very, very serious side effects and costs that come along with that. But this is sort of the, the tragic nature of the trade-off we think that state governments face, and you know, this is this is partly why we're just we strike such a pessimistic tone because it is it is very unfortunate that this is the most efficient, feasible option. We wish it weren't. This is certainly not ideal, um, but this this is sort of the pessimistic space that we are working in and thinking in. Did we miss a question, Patrick? I feel like we missed one question. Uh, let's see. Yeah, there was this uh, question from um, Nandini about the yeah, yeah. um, right. role of race, but also just um, how does the state authorities reacting to marginalized communities and the like? So I think, I, I, I mean, I'll just, to answer this question, I'll affirm what Chris said at the very end, which is in some ways, like you can think about the, two by two space here, this is in reply to how does race play a role in this aspect, as which point in this two by two space doesn't eliminate racial social control or racialized oppression, because we think that's just not possible within this two by two space, but which minimizes it. So race insofar as black people are overrepresented amongst the truly disadvantaged, race does play a role in our thinking about the prioritarian justification for where to be in this two by two space, as Chris was arguing. And so you could think of this as a, as a way to minimize racial oppression with only these tools. So I suppose that's one way of thinking about it. I'm not sure I quite understand the first question, but maybe we can come back about that. Did you want to say anything about that, Chris? Uh, we've got a few more questions. No, I think that's okay. Let's, let's uh, try to answer as many questions as we can. All right, so the next two, which are written in the chat, I think overlap and you know perhaps are right asking you to elaborate more on the question of guns. They, they, one says, you have concluded that the level of serious crime is driven by the pervasiveness of concentrated disadvantage. Did you explore the number of guns per capita in the US versus elsewhere? And then the next one is, I'm also curious about the role of gun control in this. Seems that it would play a large role in decreasing the rate of violent crime. And then um, Jana Saad will, uh, wants to ask a question and she would like to go on camera. Sure. Hi, Donna and Chris. Um, I, I, I want to go back to that, um, to your calculations of the welfare implications of the U.S. moving to that uh, first world balance that you suggest. And Shall I'm I wondering, the, would it be helpful to put them on the screen? Or? Sure, sure. Um, and I hope I didn't miss something here, but um, okay. And I'm wondering if you're not um, if you're not underestimating, right, the, the sort of years of life lost or the welfare trade-off here, particularly associated with arrests, um, if, you know, by not considering uh, longer term, uh, sort of longer term implications of arrests may be associated with, with um, prospects for employment and, and things of that nature. And I, th I think you talked a little bit about 
looking at other dimensions of this of this welfare, right? Um, and so if you could talk a little bit more about that and your thoughts on that, that'd be great. Thanks. Great question. Chris, do you want to take that and then I'll take the gun question? Okay, yeah. So let's start with this welfare calculation. So the, the worry here really, as I take it, is that arrests might have a whole bunch of collateral consequences that are not taken into account in this table, and that might flip the, the calculation uh, so that it doesn't come out in favor of the first world balance, right? So we know that uh, arrest records can be debilitating on the rental housing market and on the labor market at times. Um, where, how, does, how do these kinds of consequences fit into this picture? Um, and what we would say about that is, look, this table only details the kind of first order consequences associated with all of these different um, I guess you, I, I guess you could say avenues uh, for harm, right? So there's the first order consequences of incarceration are only are those that are felt by people who themselves are imprisoned. But there are a whole bunch of collateral consequences of incarceration on families and communities. And the same thing with homicides, for example, right? The first order consequence is the consequence for the person who is murdered, but their family also faces these deep consequences and their communities face deep consequences. Um, so our provocation is that these kinds of collateral consequences or nth order effects of prisons, policing and crime will scale uh, kind of with, with each other, along with each other. So we don't see any reason to think that the collateral consequences of arrest would would be scaling at a much uh, higher rate than say the collateral consequences of homicides or or the collateral consequences of imprisonment. Um, so this is just this chart here is just on the first order consequences. Um, Adana, do you want to say a bit more about that? I think the other thing to say is that let's say that we're wrong about exactly that and maybe they scale twice as much or something like that as the nth order consequences of the others. Well, you, could, you can see from these numbers that you can multiply arrests by two, you can multiply by three, and it wouldn't make much difference. You'd really have to think that the collateral consequences of arrest specifically are just so large relative to the collateral consequences or this nth order consequences of the others. And we just don't think that's likely to be the case. But it does reveal that you know you you could challenge this argument on the on what's kind of empirical, sort of empirical normative ground. Um, but we think this the burden of proof is at this point on someone to show that. We don't see that in the literature that, that we've read. Um, and then let me just say something about guns quickly. I think um, this kind of came up yesterday as well when we were discussing the reasons for America's high level of serious crime. And what I said there was that the distribution of guns per capita does seem to explain the high levels of serious crime when you look just at the United States and Europe, but the distributions of guns per capita doesn't explain other patterns in violence that are really apparent. So it doesn't explain patterns in violence inside the United States very well at all. It's white and rich households that are more likely to have guns than poor and black households. It's also doesn't really explain patterns over time in the United States. And it doesn't really explain patterns cross nationally when you look at say the United States compared to other countries in the Americas, which have much higher rates of homicide, but much lower rates of gun ownership. So we just don't think guns really works. The other thing is that it's a little, I think it's a little difficult to think that serious disadvantage wouldn't be a, a major cause when you reflect on two other, two other two other features of concentrated disadvantage, which is like, which is that first we know that concentrated disadvantage is a key causal factor in, um, in explaining crime. We know that America has much more concentrated disadvantage than other countries. And so it would seem like we would expect America's high levels of concentrated disadvantage to produce much higher levels of crime and not 
had America not had guns at the same level of serious crime. We just, we, there's reason to expect that America should have more serious crime given what we know about America's political economy. So that's our, that's kind of our pat response to the question of guns, which is a good question. Oh, one other thing I should just say is that if you thought that gun control was the solution, it's difficult to imagine something like gun control being implemented without an expansion of policing. You can't really do anything about guns unless you expand policing. That is the mechanism by which gun control would be effective. Uh, great. So uh, we, Nandini has provided an, an, an explanation of the first question. Uh, so the, it goes as follows. I meant when state authorities are challenged by common people's movements for defending the, the marginalized people's rights in terms of their disproportionate imprisonments, how do the authorities react? I will also add the point of the role of gender in terms of imprisonment. So that we that's our last question we're, as we're running out of time. So. Sure. Chris, you want me to take it? I'll take the first and you can take the Sure, yeah. So I think, um, thanks for the clarification. I think that in effect, Chris and I are, I mean, in some ways there's a deep question here, I think about what we think states listen to and what we think they don't listen to. So, you know, we've given, as Patrick was pushing us on earlier, we've been operating in a very kind of pragmatic or pessimistic space because we don't think that states respond very readily unless there's states and elites respond readily unless there's pressure put on states and elites to demands to tax the rich to redistribute to the poor that's just something that across the history of the capitalist world across the history of the of the world doesn't happen without struggle without all kinds of social movements and class struggle but we think that the difference with respect to penal policy is that what we're arguing about here is what should be done with a fixed pool of revenue. We're not arguing for additional taxation. We're arguing that the fixed pool of revenue that the United States has and is spending today on prisons rather than police can be more efficiently allocated, more justly allocated. That's really the argument. And we think that there are some feasibility considerations there too. There are reasons to think that that would be politically difficult. There are all sorts of constituencies that would push against it, but we just think it's much more feasible than imagining that we could redistribute the wealth of the 1% to the American population. That just seems totally off the cards right now politically. All right, well, thank you so much. I mean, obviously this is a conversation that could go on for quite a while and uh, we're unfortunately limited to 90 minutes, but we really, really appreciate you taking the time the last couple of days to provide us with uh, the you know the development of your projects here and we're all looking forward i'm sure to um the book coming out so um thanks very much um i also just want to take a, an opportunity to just plug the talks that we have coming up um amal bashara on march 31st on laws violence and roadblocks to palestinian political expression and then in april a whole lineup of talks julian go on police militarization anita shridhar and An anand gopal on vaccine avoidance and the crisis of social solidarity, Deborah Cowan, then Gabe Winant. So we have a long list of folks coming up. Uh, please check out our website for details and how to register. And again, one last thanks to both um, Adoner and Chris for what was really a super interesting and stimulating talk. Thanks Thank you all. Thank you very much for, for listening and for engaging us in good faith. We really, really appreciate it. And we've learned a lot already from the comments. Yeah, thank you all so much. All right, take care, everyone. Bye.